Hello everyone. Here's my question for you today. What does God think about Christians carrying guns? Now a lot of Christians will jump to defend the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. But think about it. Jesus did say, Resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Doesn't this prove that Christians shouldn't be defending themselves? When Christ was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter drew his sword and began defending him, and Jesus told him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And shouldn't we as Christians really trust God to protect us rather than trusting weapons? How can carrying weapons that are used to kill people really help with the Great Commission that Christ gave to believers to reach people with the gospel? These are legitimate questions that Christians need to answer if they're going to be intellectually honest about holding to the authority of Scripture and at the same time carrying weapons for self-defense. Should we practice turning the other cheek rather than defending ourselves? Well, in this passage in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was quoting an Old Testament law found in Exodus 21, which gave the Jews permission to retaliate against injustice done against them, but only as severely as the injustice itself, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Earlier in the same sermon, Christ had said, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. He was not overruling the law, it seems clear that he's speaking about vengeance. The Bible often speaks against the practice of seeking revenge. Vengeance is God's responsibility and is distinctly different from self-defense. So, should we just trust God to protect us? Well, first of all, God promised to be with us in Matthew 28:20, 20, and he tells us to take no thought for our life in Luke 12:22. But then he specifically classifies that statement by saying, What ye shall eat. This is a promise to provide for us, not to protect us. David wrote, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. But he also wrote, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war, and my fingers to fight. We actually see evidence that the way that God does protect his people is with weapons. In Acts 23, some of the Jews decided that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. However, Paul's nephew overheard the Jews' plot and warned Paul about it. If Paul was opposed to personal defense, he would simply have told his nephew not to worry about it, that God would protect him. But that's not what Paul did. He told his nephew to inform the chief captain, who in turn assigned men with weapons to defend him. Sometimes, God provides protection for his people through people with weapons. Actually, this is exactly the reason why we ought to be equipped for defense, because God may desire to use us to defend others. Also, trusting God is not a good excuse not to do anything. Matthew 4, 7 says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. People who use faith as an excuse for not doing something are essentially asking God to do it for them, though they won't use the tools God has given them to do it themselves. This is called tempting God, or trying to force God to do things our way. And as far as focusing on the gospel, the Bible actually does give us a precedent for self-defense in order to accomplish the work of God. In Nehemiah 4, when the Jews were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, a job that God had sent Nehemiah to oversee, they became threatened by the people who lived around the city at the time. In order to protect themselves so that the work of God could continue, every one of them carried a weapon while they worked. They worked with all their might at what God had given them, and they took the measures necessary to protect themselves and each other so that they could continue the work. Paul, the great preacher of the gospel, also defended himself in order to continue his ministry. Most of the time, his defense consisted of fleeing a city before he was killed, but this is self-defense nonetheless, and it's certainly not turning the other cheek. Paul realized that he needed to defend himself for the purpose of living longer to reach more people with the gospel. 
Of course, when possible, he defended himself without threatening the lives of anyone else by running. But when necessary, like in the example in Acts 23, Paul was prepared to defend himself with weapons for the glory of God. Defending yourself is actually not a separate work from that of the gospel. But what about when Jesus told Peter that those that live by the sword die by the sword? Well, this passage actually explains itself when you look at it carefully. Jesus even specifically qualifies his statement by saying, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Notice that Jesus did have angels ready to defend him. Christ rebuked Peter for drawing his sword because the implication was that Christ could not defend himself. Not only that, but the Lord had told Peter in Matthew 20 that he was going to Jerusalem to die. Peter was actually fighting against the will and plan of God. He was living by the sword, trying to impose his will upon the situation by force rather than submitting by faith to what God had told him. This passage is really about the defense of God, not self-defense, because Peter was not in danger at the time. And we do not defend God or God's will or the doctrines of Scripture with weapons. Also, the sword here was actually something Peter was carrying in obedience to the command of Christ. In Luke 22, just before they left to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus actually told them to purchase swords. When they responded, saying they only had two at the time, he said, it is enough. The obvious conclusion to draw here is that they were not starting a war where everyone would need a sword, but a few of them would need swords in order to be ready to defend the others if the need should arise. There are numerous examples in Scripture where God approves of good men defending themselves against evil men. In Proverbs 25:26, we read that a righteous man who is overpowered by a wicked man is like a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. These are not positive metaphors. In 1 Timothy 5, we are told to provide for our households. And in 1 Peter 3 and Ephesians 5, men are told to care for their wives. If you have the ability to own a weapon and you do not, and a wicked man breaks into your house and harms your wife or family, you've at least failed to care for their defense. In Luke 10, Jesus used the Good Samaritan as an example of how a neighbor should act. Now, if the Samaritan had been walking by at the same time that the thieves were attacking the man, what do you think he, with his neighborly spirit, would have done? Well, if he had a weapon, he would have defended the man. And if he did not have a weapon, he would have wished that he did because that is the spirit of a true neighbor. Don't forget that Moses killed an Egyptian to defend a brother Hebrew, and God did not condemn him for it. Now, I'm not making a biblical case for owning weapons for the use of defending yourself against an aggressive government. I know this is the position of conservatives, and I'm not necessarily arguing against it. I just don't think that it can be argued biblically. The Bible tells us to be subject to our governmental rulers, even if they are unjust, as long as they are not commanding us to violate Scripture. So, that's what I find in Scripture concerning God and guns. But I want to hear what you think. Comment below with your thoughts on this. Should Christians own weapons? Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. I really appreciate it. Also, I want to remind you all that the whole Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible teaches that all men are sinners and that no sinner can have eternal life with God in heaven because we must pay for our sins for eternity in hell. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins on the cross. Since your sin has been paid for by Jesus Christ, all that is left for you to do is to accept that gift by faith. If you've never accepted the gift of God by faith, won't you do that today?